Hello, everyone. Good morning. Welcome. Glad to have you here with us. We are going to have a few moments to let people get logged in before we get started. Welcome. I see that our room is getting filled up with attendees. We're so happy that you're here. Good morning and welcome. I see that we're still seeing folks enter the room. So we'll give it a couple more minutes. Feel free to get yourself comfortable for our time that we have together. Okay, I think that um, we can get started. So I wanna just begin by welcoming everyone to our webinar this morning. My name is Amy Blackshaw and I am the Behavioral Health Project Director at the California School-Based Health Alliance. We're really happy to have you join us for this workshop today, looking at the intersections of youth mental health and vaping. This is the fifth in a five-part series that we have done both virtually and in person around youth and vaping over the past year. Um, you can find recordings of three of those uh, workshops that were done virtually on our website if you're interested in the topics that we've already covered. Um, today's webinar is meant to complement those webinars, but explore more deeply the ways that vaping is related and interconnected to youth mental health. So we're excited to have this conversation with you. I invite you to drop into the chat um, who you are, what organization you're from, what role you're in, just so we can get a sense of the room. We can't see you, but we know that you're there and um, would love to know um, who's here with us. So we will have time um, for some Q&A at the end. There is a, a Q&A um, button, so feel free to put questions in there. Um, feel free to put reactions um, or anything else in the chat uh, so we can keep keep an eye on that as we go through it. Um, and with that, we'll we'll get started. If you want to go to the to the next slide. So we are um, just want to acknowledge the CDE, the California Department of Education, for their generous support for this webinar. And you can go ahead to the next slide. And just like from, from for some technical reminders, if you're having any audio trouble, you can just use the dial-in numbers that were in your webinar link. Um, this webinar is being recorded. Uh, so we will be sharing that with you. And we'll also be sharing out some of our uh, documents, the slide deck and any uh, things that we reference, we will be sure to share with you. So you can go to the next slide. So we are the California School-Based Health Alliance. Uh, we are a statewide nonprofit organization and our mission is, is to improve the health and academic success of children and youth by advancing school health services. So we do this in a, a number of ways. We work really closely with schools and districts and health partners and other folks across the state. Uh, we convene trainings and webinars we identify experts in the field that are doing school health work, and we want to share those best practices and expertise. We host an annual conference, and we offer lots of written tools and guides to build capacity to bring more health services into schools. And all of that is available free and accessible on our website. So I encourage you to check out our website to see what's there and what might help you in your um, in your journey around being part of the school health um, world. And next slide. While we do have lots of information and trainings that are free and available through our website, we are a membership organization. So we encourage folks to become members 
to take advantage of some additional benefits. These are things like conference registration discounts and individualized technical assistance to help your organization or school enhance your school health services. Again, it's not required. A lot, most everything that we offer is free and we wanna share that widely um, that you can become a member through the link here. So next slide. <clears throat> We're really pleased today to have Dr. Priya Shankar with us. She is a physician with a passion for gender justice, intersectional feminism and reproductive and, men um, reproductive and mental health and health equity. She's a graduate of UCSF's Pediatric Leaders for the Underserved Residency Program and is also the co-founder of the award-winning organization called Adolescent Health Champions, which fights gender bias by training youth globally as gender and health peer educators. She was a former Fulbright Nori scholar in, to India and a Fogarty NIH fellow where she focused on global adolescent health. And currently she's an assistant professor of pediatrics at UCSF Benioff Children's Hospital, Oakland. She's also a medical provider at Youth Uprising at Castlemont High School in Oakland, which is a school-based health center, focusing on teen school-based health and primary care. And so she supports young people on a daily basis with mental health related challenges and struggles with addiction. So with that, I wanna hand it over to Priya, Dr. Priya Shankaran. Thank you so much, Amy, and really excited to be here. To everyone who's here, I hope that this is a really helpful conversation that we have. I hope it's informal as well. This is going to be some of my perspectives and what I've learned from working with youth at the teen center, at the school-based sites, and in primary care, and just seeing such an increase in the rise in vaping, but also a deep connection with mental health. So looking forward to this conversation today. And I would like to start with an acknowledgement just to thank um, someone who has put a lot of time and support into this presentation as well, Pragati Kalive, who is part of the NGO Adolescent Health Champions as well, and who supports in curriculum design and mental health. She's received a bachelor's in psychology and so has a real passion for the intersection of vaping and mental health as well. And I just wanted to say thank you for her support on this presentation today. And I'm hoping really, really to, you know, shed light on this topic in many, many more ways. So today we're talking about youth vaping and mental health. And this is something that is not widely discussed. I think it's Amy had brought this to my attention and she was, and I loved that you did because it's something that we're seeing more in our clinical settings. And it's also something that's deeply under underexplored and that we really need to be doing more research on as well. But I hope that this will begin, begin a long conversation on the topic. So when it comes to youth mental health and vaping, there's a lot of layers to it. I would say that first, there are triggers, our mental health factors that really result in young people kind of reaching for a vape or starting or initiate vape, initiating vaping. Then there's the consequences of vaping itself. So vaping impacting the brain itself and different parts of the brain and then resulting in mental health challenges. And then after that, we're seeing that there's an addict addiction cycle. So we're gonna talk about all of those things in this webinar. We're also gonna be talking about ways to support young people and how do we actually talk to young people who are struggling with this challenge or might be facing this dual challenge of mental health related issues and um, addiction or vaping. So I hope it's helpful and you know, please feel free to add any questions you have, um, any thoughts that you have, any experiences that you've had with this to the chat. So to start our presentation, I thought we could have a little poll just to have a little bit of interaction during this presentation. So I would ask if we can start our poll. And can folks see the poll? I hope hopefully we can see it. Yeah, I think it's visible Priya. Perfect. It looks like we have about a hundred, over a hundred folks have responded so far. We'll give another moment and then we can close it and see the results. Awesome. Okay, last chance to complete the poll and I'm gonna go ahead and close it.
Excellent. So I'm I'm really impressed with this group. We kind of have an audience that knows a lot about this issue. And you're absolutely right um, that it's one out of every seven to 10 high school students. Um, it's about one out of every 30 middle, middle school students. So, and these numbers are from 2022. I think that those numbers change and I think we still have to really sample and do more research, but we're absolutely right. So great job to our amazing audience here. <laughs> and so let's talk a little bit about it. So this is one of the surveys that looked at e-cigarette use amongst United States youth. And yes, one in 10 high school students have really used e-cigarettes. Some, some are even saying one in seven is the range for high school students and one in 30 for middle, middle school students, as I mentioned. And um, a couple of important facts to note is that more than a quarter of current e-cigarette users are using e-cigarettes e every single day. So we know that this is addictive. We know that people, when they start e-cigarettes are using them on a daily consistent basis. And um, there's an amazing organization called Truth Initiative that's been doing a lot of research in this area too, and has found that there's a deep link with mental health. And, you know, one of their studies has found that, you know, the initiation of vaping is often related to stress, anxiety, and depression. We've also found from other studies that it can be related to peer pressure, but one of their recent studies looked at, you know, rates of depression and anxiety and stress and how that really resulted in, you know, e-cigarette use and vaping use. And in addition to that, one out of every two youth vapors are using it to deal with stress and anxiety. So that's just a big, big example of how related this is to one's mental health. And the continuation of vaping is also related to one's mental health as well. So I want to talk a little bit and highlight COVID because I think it's really important to contextualize everything that we're seeing in the context of the pandemic. And the pandemic has had such a major impact on our entire society, as we know, and it's really impacted the mental health and substance use patterns of our young people. Things like the lockdown, social distancing, and isolation have really affected our young people. So we, and we know this, you know, just the uncertainty that young people have experienced you know, not being able to interact with their peers, so many things like that have affected young people's mental health and well-being. And our adolescents are also at a really critical period of their own development, their psychosocial development, their biological development, and, you know, factors like isolation, loneliness, grief, loss of agency have all been a big part of the pandemic, as we know. And this can really impact substance use patterns. So I think it is very, very important to note that, um, you know, the rates of anxiety and depression have increased in this pandemic. We know that globally, almost 25%, there's been an increase in depression and anxiety, but also substance use. You know, when we're talking about being isolated, being inside the house, um, a lot of young people, what I've been seeing, have been turning to things like vaping, which are accessible, don't really require interaction with other people. And um, this is one of the starting places of some of the addiction cycle and the substance use cycle that we're seeing. I do want to acknowledge that this deeply impacts our marginalized and our vulnerable populations in the United States. Not only the initiation of vaping and the initiation of substance use, the targeted ads that we're seeing in the United States around our vulnerable and our marginalized populations, and even being able to access treatment and de-addiction support is really impacting our populations dip differently. And this is a racial justice issue as well. And I wanna talk about that from a equity and a racial justice standpoint as well. And lastly, COVID-19 we know has really disrupted our mental health services. We know that just accessing therapy, accessing de-addiction services has all been really, really changed during the pandemic. And we're only now starting to see some positive elements to that, some positive shifts, but you know, there's still a long, long way to go. Um, I loved this from the WHO. It's from across 130 countries. And I just want to highlight two facts or two points from this. And that is that amongst our teens, 72% reported disruptions to mental health services during the pandemic. We also saw disruptions in counseling and psychotherapy, which are very, very important when we're coming to thinking about quitting or cessation of, you know, smoking or cessation of substance use or any form of addiction, and also talking about our school service disruption. So young people might have turned previously to safety nets within the school. 
And for so many years, you know, the last few years with the pandemic, not having those services, not having those support services has deeply impacted them, not only in terms of coping skills for pandemic related distress, but also when it comes to de-addiction or, you know, really, really dealing with issues of addiction, having the support networks at school. So I'm really glad you're all here because we have a long way to go to kind of come back and bounce back from that and also really augment those supports um, during this post-pandemic period. So why are our teens more likely to turn to vaping? There's a lot of reasons and um, it's multifactorial. So I think the first one I will mention is peer pressure. So we all know that our teens will, you know, want to fit in and, you know, may feel pressured by their peers to start vaping. And one of the studies from the CDC has suggested that that is actually the reason, the first reason that teens will start to vape. Other studies, you know, I mentioned the Truth Initiative mentioned that it's more very, very common amongst those who are experiencing some degree of distress, um, some, some degree of anxiety and depression. So there's a lot of different reasons. Now, in addition to that, I, I do think that to take some of the guilt and to take some of the shame away, I would like to just mention that this is not individual only. We have strategic marketing and advertising messages that have been going out to our young people that really target young people and make it really, really appealing. So it's not a surprise that our young people are turning to vaping for support during really challenging times. In addition to that, things like lack of coping skills, you know, just not being able to develop those coping skills, especially I would say during the pandemic, not having friendships, not having peer support, not having our school social workers, our school teachers to also support and guide our young people in person is one way that um, the lack of coping skills, the lack of interaction can really contribute to young people turning to vaping. And the last one I want to mention is misinformation. I think on the one hand, there's this marketing component of it, but on the other hand, it's that we are still researching the, the effect, effects of vaping, and there's often not a lot of knowledge around the risks associated with vaping. I think a lot of the discourse that we see, we, which you, you all have probably seen, is around lung injury and effects on the lung, but around mental health and the long-term impacts of vaping, we're still getting to know those things. And there's also misinformation in the sense of a lot of folks thinking that vaping is really not that bad. You know, it's flavored. It, it It's actually like, you know, the flavoring makes it really addictive and it can't be that bad. So I think those kinds of messaging really impact the misinformation about how it can impact a young person in a lot of different ways. So I, I stress this point around um, mental health and um, vaping. I really want to talk about big tobacco advertising because it's related. It's very, very relevant to um, why young people are turning to vaping. Um, we know that firstly, vapes come in all kinds of flavors and really attractive packaging. And that really attracts young people when they're in vulnerable moments. Maybe they're feeling depressed, they're feeling down. It's also that we're seeing there's a lot of marketing around stress relief. So the stress relief aspect, you know, when young people are seeing, oh, you know what, this is going to make me feel better after this whole pandemic or whatever challenges they're experiencing in their life, that's um, very, very important to note. And other things to note about it is that, you know, unlike cigarettes, which, you know, are thought of as really harsh and dry, vaping is not viewed as that in that way. And all of those things impact um, a young people, a young person's choice to start vaping and continue vaping. And in addition to that, I do want to really mention these ads, because when I talk about this being a social justice and a racial justice issue, we know that marketing efforts are 10 times more likely to go into black and brown communities and actually share these types of messages. So this is one very, very important fact for us to talk about and to note. And um, talking about the mental health piece of it, we're seeing ads by camel, which say that, you know, for more pleasure, have a camel. So really like targeting the pleasure piece of mental health that you're going to feel much, much better. How's your disposition today? I mean, those are from the start, you know, from the start of, you know, these advertisements, we're seeing that sort of connection. And similarly with Newport, we're seeing that, um, you know, after all, if smoking isn't a pleasure, why, bo why bother? And even taglines that are all about pleasure. So that comes to actually when we think about the advertising around um, vapes. So a popular brand is, um, you know, we know this popular brand Puff Bar. And I, I really want to stop and think about this particular ad because 
young people who were going through so much pandemic stress, the language and specific words that are used here, such as, you know, to stay sane, you know, um, that this is the perfect escape from back-to-back -back Zoom calls, parental texts, and work from home stress. So, you know, parental texts and that pressure that young people are feeling, staying at home, cooped up at home, there is no, um, you know, it's, it's not a surprise. There's no surprise that, you know, we're seeing young people turning to this, you know, feeling down, feeling depressed in the pandemic, maybe existing mental health conditions, and then thinking that, hey, maybe this is going to help me, maybe this is going to help me feel better. And um, I, I, I really want to point this out, because the parental text piece, it's hidden amongst so many other parts that look like they're targeted for adults, but it's such an important piece that it's actually about teens, and it's very strategically marketed to teens. So this is a this is something that I think really contextualizes the way that nicotine can impact our mental health and result in somewhat of an addiction cycle. So we've talked a little bit about why young people in a vulnerable state of mental health will reach to, you know, or begin or initiate vaping. But let's talk about what happens next. So once a young person, you know, starts, you know, maybe starts to go ahead and reach for a vape, nicotine is then absorbed. And after that, there are multiple mental health impacts. Firstly, there's this arousal euphoria, mood modulation, and, and there is that feeling of pleasure. So just like these ads are saying, young people will start to feel better. They'll start to feel this bit of dopamine and euphoria. And But that is short-lived. You know, that is really a short-lived piece of this. And moving on to what happens next is other factors that deeply impact a young person's mental health. So things like tolerance and dependence. So young people really struggling with, you know, stopping or like wanting more and wanting more. And we'll talk about the physiological reasons for that in a second. Then moving to withdrawal. So the, seeing behavioral changes like young people feeling anxious or irritable and that affecting their mood. Even, you know, when it comes to them what's the focus of their mind, they'll be focusing more on how do I get the next vape rather than other things in their life. And so those are all ways that behavior is changed. And lastly, craving. And so once that craving hits in, going back to the nicotine initiation cycle. So this is an important cycle and it relates to that loop that does very much connect with mental health as well. So nicotine and drugs specifically have lots of impacts on the brain. And this is specifically important for our teens because their brains are in such a state of development. And, you know, our adult brain is, is mostly developed, but our teen brain, you know, even until 21 and 22 is still developing. So there are lots and lots of roles that nicotine can play when it comes to a young person's brain. And I want to talk about a few of them. And I think that this is going to seem very sciencey, but I share it because this is exactly how you know, our vaping can deeply impact our mental health on a physiological level and, you know, a biochemical level. So when it comes to the impact, let's start with the, you know, we can start with the basal ganglia, which is the light blue area of the brain. So first, this is important for motivation and healthy activities. And it is also considered the reward circuit of the brain. So things like nicotine will overactivate the circuit. So it's going to produce that initial feeling of euphoria. But importantly, repeated exposure is going to really diminish the sensitivity over time, and it's going to make it harder to feel pleasure later on. So that's an important place to think about or thing to think about. The second is the extended amygdala. And the amygdala is very important and actually plays a role in our feelings of stress, irritability, and anxiety. And we always think about the amygdala when we think about withdrawal. So importantly, this circuit, circuit actually becomes more sensitive over time because, you know, it's actually with increased use, it's telling us that I feel anxious, I feel more irritable when I don't have the drug and I need more of it. Importantly for teens, we know specifically that nicotine and vaping can really affect memory. And this is true even for cannabis, cannabis vaping as well. This can affect memory and it can affect the stressors and the initiation or increase in stressors in our life and the stressful feelings in our life. And lastly, I would mention the prefrontal cortex. So we've all heard of this, and this is kind of like the central place. This is the dark blue area of the brain. And it's this part that's important for our ability to think and plan to solve problems and make decisions. 
it's also one of the last place to develop in the brain. So for a teen, right? So it's one of the last latter later parts of the brain to develop. And so one of the things I always think about with the prefrontal cortex is impulse control. And so when we are sort of shifting the balance in our brain and um, we are, you know, facing addiction, um, we might impulsively seek out the drug and not have the ability to really reduce our impulses. So that's really, really important to note that these are many, many different ways that our brain is impacted by substances, specifically vaping. Now, other things to note, and you probably have thought about some of these things, are the impact on neurotransmitters. So importantly, substances like nicotine can increase the amount of dopamine in our in our brain. So we see rising rates of dopamine initially. So that's why young people feel really, really great after they vape. They feel euphoric. They feel awesome. But even the number of receptors for nicotine will increase and the demand will increase and the supply, you know, will, so subsequently the body will say, I need more supply. I want more supply. And so that's one of the things that we'll start to see in the body there are structural changes to the brain that occur as a result of nicotine. And I think this is one that a lot of people don't think about, but I think there are actual changes to the brain when it comes to atrophy of the brain, shrinkage of the brain as a result of nicotine and vaping. And this can impact a young person's development. And lastly, I just want to mention that this is a really symbiotic relationship. I think it's not simply that, um, you know, mental health results, poor mental health results in someone, you know, going ahead and initiating vaping. I think that vaping also has been shown to sort of exacerbate mental health related conditions in a lot of different ways. So young people who are struggling with mental health challenges might actually really be ex having worsening symptoms, or it might actually precipitate other conditions. So, you know, that's something that um, I would like to share. And I have seen patients that I've been working with who, you know, have developed things like as extreme, you know, sometimes it's it's in the middle of moderate depression, anxiety, irritability, but I've also seen young people who are vaping develop challenges like psychosis and really, really struggle with their mental health because of that. So just things to think about in terms of the range of impacts that, you know, this can have on a young person's mental health. And of course, lastly, withdrawal and dependence are factors that affect our overall behavior and our mental health as well. And um, I briefly want to mention this, we can always mention this later on, but I, I want to mention this because I think that this is part of the misinformation that, you know, firstly, that vaping is not as not very bad, there's not many negative consequences of it, but also when it comes to cannabis vaping, so that's not nicotine vaping, but cannabis vaping, there's this concern or there's this belief that it's really safe, it's really safe and it's not very dangerous, but it's important to note that cannabis vaping is also dangerous for a young person's brain because the actual concentration is very, very high. And this makes it such that there can be negative side effects, including addiction, issues with brain development and poor mental health, just as we see with nicotine as well. So, um, the, you know, this is somewhat of a, a little bit of a technical video, but the key point of it, I would say, is that, you know, the teen brain is really at a place of vulnerability for nicotine and for addiction. And I think that's the key message I want to share, but I'd love for you guys to take a quick look. It's just a minute. I think more and more now people see addiction as a developmental disorder. We think about addiction uh, as something that just happens to adults, but in truth is it really has its roots stemmed in adolescence. That when first, that's when first people, most of the people who become addicted try drugs. For example, if you start uh, using an illicit drug before you're 18, you're 20, you have a chance of, we have a 25% chance of becoming addicted. But if you start using an illicit drug after the age of 21, you only have a 4% chance of becoming addicted. So adolescence is a, is a crucial time for the development of addiction. And I started to become very interested in that because I looked at the effect of nicotine on cocaine. And I found that actually nicotine has a very unique ability to um, basically loosen the DNA. And Eric was talking about gene expression. And when that DNA is loosened, what happens is that when cocaine comes along, then there's a much more massive increase of gene, uh, of gene expression that's related to addiction. And in my research, I started looking at the effect of nicotine specifically on cocaine. And I found that nicotine has this effect that it increases gene expression 
that's related to addiction. But what I found actually later in adolescence was something very different. I didn't expect that. I thought that nicotine would do that even more so in adolescence. But I found something very different because when I looked at the adolescent brain uh, at baseline, I saw that the, the, the DNA was already loosened up in that particular area in the brain in the nucleus accumbens. So at baseline, the adolescent brain is much more sensitive to the effect of almost any other drug of abuse. And so if you um, expose the adolescent brain to any, any of those drugs, you'll get more of that growth that Eric described because the DNA is more open, basically open to soaking up new experiences. So this is the compact DNA um, that you see that oftentimes in, in adults. And what I saw in adolescence was something, was a very different picture. It was something more like that a much looser DNA. So the, the, the gene expression, so the genes that are over there basically can get expressed a lot more in that particular stance when it's more loose. So I, I hope that's just another way. Not only is it all the- I think more and more now people see- not, is it, not only is it the neurotransmitters and the, um, you know, the structural changes to the brain and you know the developmental impacts that I mentioned, but there's actual reasons when we look at the gene expression, when we look at the DNA itself, that our adolescent brains are truly primed for being susceptible to these various impacts that we just talked about. And um, so that really, I hope helps a little bit when it comes to understanding how vaping impacts one's mental health. And I also wanna just mention that on a bigger perspective, we have done research on e-cigarette users that really links vaping with worsening mental health symptoms. And that is in the case of anxiety, really um, higher heightened anxiety, depression, sleep problems, and even um, there's a link with those who are impacted by ADHD, but also other mental illnesses being more likely to sort of initiate, experiment, and self-medicate. And I'll talk a little bit more about this as well. So starting with anxiety and depression, you know, this is, again, as I mentioned, there's this false belief that vaping can be such a huge stress relief and have a major stress relieving impact. And in reality, what we're seeing is that smokers and vapors are experiencing more irritability, more anxiety, more depression, and that's not really relieved through the smoking or the vaping. And, um, you know, as a result of this, we see that young people might not develop healthy coping strategies. So things like social connection, physical activity, or seeing a mental health professional as well. And I go back to this because, you know, this kind of describes that over 50% of vapors reported experiencing symptoms of depression in the past week compared to 25% of non-vapors. So this is really the connection, a deep, deep, deep connection. And that's a similar kind of parallel with anxiety as well. When it comes to sleep, and you know, we don't really think about sleep as much when it comes to mental health, but I when I when I talk to a young person, I'm often, you know, doing something called a heads assessment. So that's going through things like what's going on at home, what's going what's going on in school, what are their activities, what is their sleep like, how is their mood, and getting a holistic picture. And when I see major disruptions in sleep like this, I will think about vaping, and I will think about other substance uses because nicotine can do things like increase one's heart rate, blood pressure, alertness, and it makes it really hard to sleep. So asking that question in our school settings or in our clinical settings is really, really important. And aside from that, not only is it hard to sleep, it's hard to stay asleep. So things like nicotine or things like the chemicals within vapes can really impact, um, you know, the ability to stay asleep. And so when you're actually being, your whole sleep cycle is being interfered, you can end up being super fatigued during the day, feeling really sleepy, and that can deeply impact one's mental health as well. I, I just mentioned this because it's another connection between mental health and vaping, and that's in relation to ADHD. And um, there's been some really interesting studies that have talked about, you know, having ADHD Sometimes our young people are actually in an effort to cope and to, in an effort to self-medicate might actually turn to a vape. And so it's just something to think about when we have our young people who are struggling with ADHD and struggling to cope with it. So something to think about, something to keep on our radars when we're interacting with young people with ADHD as well. And, you know, to, to go full circle, we talked about, you know, 
mental health challenges contributing to initiation of vaping and then our mental health challenges resulting in us continuing vaping. So what happens when we stop vaping? And I think this is one of the parts that I really love to talk about with young people. And I think, you know, it really helps them understand that there's, there is a light at the end of the tunnel and that, you know, quitting vaping can actually be a really, really positive thing on mental health. So it's been shown that quitting vaping can improve symptoms of anxiety and depression. It can improve sleep quality. It can improve one's appetite and it can actually make people feel more relaxed. Of course, the process, that whole process is a challenging one. And it's one that I see every day and I see how long this can actually take, you know, and, and the patience required. But once one, an individual is on that pathway and on that cycle, it's, I've really seen the benefits in my own clinic. And also the studies indicate the same thing. So um, I, I wanted to share a quick video and then pause if there are any questions real quick, because this video I think is the perfect, it has a few youth voices. And I also loved that it just kind of shows the full circle of exactly why we're here to talk about the intersection of vaping and mental health. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share this video with you all. It's just a couple minutes. All right. So it is day number two. Um, I just woke up and the first thing I did was go to grab my vape, which usually sits right about there. But I wasn't there this morning. That's Parker. He's a college student, a gamer, and has been nicotine free for about five months. Parker started vaping while he was a freshman in high school because a bunch of his friends were doing it. Back then, he would turn to vaping to relieve his anxiety but now believes the habit was making his anxiety worse. What made you start to realize that connection? There were times where I would go out and I would like need to have my vape with me like at all times. And whenever I would get anxious, I would hit it. And when I didn't have it, it would exemplify the effects of my anxiety and my stress. When you look back now at how you were feeling when you were vaping, how strong is the connection between your vape pen and anxiety? extremely strong. I, I think that most times where I had like mass amounts of anxiety or panic, it was always correlated to the fact that I had it with me or I was using it. The Truth Initiative, a nonprofit working to combat tobacco use and nicotine addiction, is helping Parker share his story as part of their ongoing effort to help young people quit. A survey by the organization found that 81% of people start vaping to decrease anxiety, depression, or stress. But some experts say it does the opposite. People who have a tendency to have mental health problems, increased stress, anxiety, depression are more likely to vape. But vaping also worsens mental health symptoms, particularly of stress, anxiety, and sometimes depression as well. And here's the science behind it. Initially, you get this boost of dopamine into your brain that really trips people into thinking, oh yeah, this is something that's good. I, it definitely feels good. But over time, what happens is your body creates more nicotine receptors in the pleasure center of the brain, making it harder for you to reduce stress through any other means than to take another hit of this product. That's why Dr. Winnikoff says vaping is so dangerous, but there is a silver lining. If you are able to quit, it actually creates a really positive mental health picture, uh, which is why cessation programs are just so important because there's no, there's nothing about this that traps you forever. Alyssa Bottolato quit vaping about a year ago and hasn't looked back. My anxiety is better. I'm able to have clearer thoughts. Um, just overall, I feel more myself and I feel better. But what would you say to someone who, who's there right now who thinks that vaping is actually helping their mental health? I would look them straight in the face and say, that's what I thought too, but it's not the truth. So if you have that even little bit of yourself that wants to quit, wants to get over it, you're already there. That's all that it takes. And you just have to put some drive behind them and you'll see the positive outcomes that will come into your life. Yeah, so I, I really, I, I show you guys that video because we've talked so much about vaping and mental health. And I think that shows the full circle that we just spoke about. And I hope that was really helpful. Um, I did want to just pause for two seconds to ask first, first, have, have you guys been seeing this in your clinical or your school-based health settings? And has this been a major challenge? I just wanted to stop for two seconds before we continue. 
and I cannot see the chat. So yeah. <laughs> if you see any point, even just any perspectives or thoughts on what we just shared, because this is this is the part of the science that I, I think is emerging and really important. And, um, you know, it's often overlooked. It's like, this is our mental health on one side. This is the addiction on the other side. Let's treat them separately. But actually, this is really, really, really deeply intertwined. So just going to pause any thoughts, reflections. What are you seeing? And Priya, I know you can't see the chat, but just yes, we have a few yeses. I have seen this on my <laughs> campus. Um, yeah. One person has a question um, that maybe you can just address quickly. Sure. Um, she's asking, is it easier for teens to quit vaping after experimenting a few times at a young age? Her daughter experimented initially because of peer pressure. So just so I understand, is that compared to at a later age of life? Or do you mean more like if it had just been one or two versus you know, a, a, a more significant number of attempts or number of experiences. Just trying to understand the question mm -hmm. a little bit more. Um, but I can try, you know what, I'm just going to address both. Okay, yeah. So <laughs> I, I think that the very nascent brain of a really like young teen, like tend to, there's like, we, we call it early adolescent, late adolescence. The earlier we start, there's a little bit more danger, I would say. And, and, and at all phases of a young person's brain development, it's, it's, it's not the safest thing to be vaping. But when it comes to, you know, actually quitting, we, act, we know that when you're exposed to more and more experiences, it's harder and harder. And I mentioned some of the parts of the brain that make it harder to quit. So I think if it's one or two times spread apart and rather than a repeated exposure, that's, that's gonna make it easier to quit for sure. Great. And we have some questions that I'm going to hold till the end, sure. um, just so you can continue on. But um, I am noting these questions that are coming in both on the chat and the Q&A. Awesome. Keep them coming. And I also am really hoping to hear from some of you and your own experiences. And I will just say my own practice as a clinician has really changed when I've started to see this link and this loop. All right, so, so it is oops, one again. All right, so I have one more poll for our whole um, audience, and I would love if we could share that real quick. And the poll is now open, and attendees are voting. Okay, giving a, a moment, another second or two to place your, to answer the poll, and then we'll go ahead and close it. This is really, really helpful, and I love all the different perspectives. So are you guys able to see the responses? Or is it, oh, you are, okay. So this is really, really helpful. I think um, truthfully, I, I, I was actually trying to learn myself about what is the most effective thing? What, is there one thing that's better than the other? And I have found that actually there's, none of the studies at this point have said that one approach is better than the other. And I think what is most effective is an individualized approach for young people. It could include a combination of things. It could include peer support, adult support, and nicotine replacement. It could involve behavioral therapy. It could involve motivational interviewing. And in fact, you know, it's really, truly, we need to take it each individual by each individual. There's no one size fits all approach. But I, I share, I shared the other options because those are also really, really important ways for young people to quit vaping as well. So when it comes to supporting youth with addiction, um, I also would love for those, I cannot see the chat, but I would love for those who are here to share some things that have worked for you. And um, I think it'd be really nice to hear from you all too. But in, um, in what I have seen and what I really believe is that only the student can really let us know and only they can decide if they're ready to change. And this is a really hard thing, especially for clinicians, to you know, swallow. It's a very difficult pill to swallow because we want quick results <laughs> and we want people to you know understand the science. And yes, I think one of the most amazing things I've seen is that sometimes the first conversation is 
met with resistance, but over time with a non-judgmental approach and, you know, just continuing to discuss the impacts, I have seen young people really being open to it. And, you know, I think this can be, it can really test a clinician's or an educator's patience. But I think the, the most important thing is to come from a space of understanding and come from a space of only you can decide if you want to change. This is my opinion. This is what I what this is what I would recommend. Um, what do you think? And I, I think starting with just being aware. I think you know a lot of um, times as a clinician, it's easy to be very very blindsided. You could have a kid. I have had young people come in with headaches. That's it. You know, and that's the presenting symptom. And or they might come in with some, you know, mood changes and we'll immediately turn to like, okay, this is these headaches, let's treat the headaches. And we might not think about things like vaping, but realizing that drug addiction and even vaping can have a host and myriad of impacts on the body. And that could include the psychological things we talked about, that could include the physical things like headaches, disturbances in sleep, weight changes. I've seen a lot of young people lose a lot of weight in the context of, um, you know, vaping and also those who have gained weight, each body is different, but, you know, physiologically how, how someone will react. And of course the behavioral changes. So I think those of you all here who have teens at home might see things like, you know, not interacting as much and maybe some secretive behaviors or withdrawal from loved ones, or maybe not as interested in the things that they were doing before. And I think just having that awareness is the first step in all of our journeys. I think everyone here, all of our journeys of, you know, really supporting young people and being there and being allies. And aside from that, I think these are some amazing tips for talking to young people. Actually, um, Amy had shared this and they're really, really helpful tips. I, I have personally used them in my own conversations with teens, but I think, um, you know, remembering what's age appropriate and meeting a young person where they're at creating a safe space. I think educating ourselves and reading about addiction, reading about vaping, learning about it is really, really important. Identifying the signs and symptoms, encouraging young people to just be themselves and to share their thoughts without that sort of confrontational attitude or um, relationality with them as much as is possible. I think this one I stopped for a second because I think um, just being the adult who says, you know, maybe we need to get some additional support. You know, maybe we need to get some extra help. That can be really, really beneficial for a young person to hear like, oh, there's more support. There's more that I could do. There's more steps to be taken. I'm not alone in this. I think that's a really, really important role that we can play. Developing healthy coping strategies and Celebrating successes. Um, I think the real thing that I have learned from my own journey with working with young people is patience. I have had to see young people for over nine months, and then only am I, am I seeing them really say, you know what, I'm actually ready to talk about this. I'm actually ready to change my mind around this. I'm actually realizing that this is really impacting my mental health, and I need to possibly change my behaviors. So patience is huge. and um, you know, celebrating small successes that are happening along the way, such that you're not ostracizing them or pushing them away and you're you're noticing the changes that are happening. And the last two that I want to mention um, are really, really important because they're important for both the aspects of, you know, supporting a young person, you know, the initiation and also the recovery. So I think somebody had mentioned there like a, a young person who had started and was able to stop vaping. But a big part of that is supportive peers. So, you know, having supportive peers who can help young people recover during the journey, um, discour discouraging them from spending time with people who might encourage the addictive behaviors and patterns. And, um, you know, those are all going to be important pieces, but not the only piece. And I say this as someone who's seeing young people struggling with addiction every single day and with um, mental health challenges every day, every single day and um, seeking support for ourselves because we need to be our 100% when we're having these conversations with young people. They can be emotionally taxing and emotionally challenging conversations. <laughs> and I think you all who are here have experienced this or maybe have seen this and you know, just taking space for ourselves so that we can have the space to have the patience and grace for our young people. And we can have the grace to realize 
they are at such a vulnerable period. This is a time of tremendous change in their physical and mental health. And there are a lot of features and factors, whether it's ads, whether it's peers that are actually promoting this and make it really hard for someone to say no. So having just the, you know, just the grace for them, giving them some grace. And I'd also say being an askable adult, um, I think this is something that is part of the OUSD Healthy Oakland teens. And um, it's a, I wanted to just reference and cite them because I really like these points of, you know, listening more than we speak and not laughing at a young person if they come to us with a question. And I, I, I stand by this, but being okay to say, I actually don't know the answer to that. I will say that even in thinking about this topic, you know, as a clinician, I always want to keep researching. I always want to keep learning because the, the studies that are coming out are new and they're constantly new sources that are coming out. So having the humility to say, hey, let's learn together. Let's actually look this up together. And, um, you know, thinking through your own values around um, vaping and things like that and mental health so that you can have um, a, a really non-judgmental attitude when you're um, approaching young people. This is, um, in brief, motivational interviewing. I also practice this clinically, and I, I share this because um, there's a really nice handbook and playbook for motivational interviewing. This is something that we can all learn in our day-to-day -day lives with young people when we're working with young people, but of course, in the clinical or the school-based health settings. It's about expressing empathy, and so empathy towards our young people. And that comes from, you know, coming from a place of understanding and respect and compassion, like, okay, and um, where are you at really understanding? How can I be there to support you? I think that's the question I often ask young people to understand where are they? And um, I really like the second piece, which is develop discrepancy. And what that is about is to try to help them identify the gaps between what are their goals and what is their current behavior? And I think those two things might not align, especially when it comes to vaping and addiction. And so saying it out loud, like, what are your goals? You know, what, what are you hoping for? What are your dreams? And I talk about this all the time with my, with my young people, like, what are your goals? And, um, you know, saying, okay, like there might not be, those might not be aligned right now, but we can get there. What are the steps we need to take to get there? I like the role with resistance because, as I've said, I've had to learn tremendous patience <laughs> and um, also wanting to not be the provider or the clinician who is perpetuating power struggles or um, that is hindering progress with um, a patient and instead being, you know, using gentle questioning. I like to think about that gentle questioning, which is more about like, OK, so what's the reasons that we're resisting this? What are the reasons that, you know, we we don't want to change or we don't want to quit? And what are what let's talk about those things. And ultimately, it's up to the young person. But I think helping young people find the motivation to change is really important. And um remaining their collaborative partner. I, I believe that those two are actually connected, like remaining their collaborative partner despite the roller coaster ride and the ups and downs, which I have seen. And I think um, despite the, the setbacks and then the movement forward is very important. And the last one, which we use as part of a HEADS assessment is I add a strength, a, a strength. And the HEADS assessment is a way that we just get information to understand a, a teen's holistic health from the clinical setting. And I add strengths because it's really important when young people are talking about vaping and talking about their mental health and talking about maybe a challenge they're experiencing to also say, hey, where, when have you overcome challenges? What are the strengths that you possess? When have you had successes? Because when we identify those things, it reminds young people like, oh, I actually am capable of doing this. This is not, you know, impossible. This is not going to be something that we can't overcome. And I, I want to really um, encourage all of us to really remember that point. You know, oftentimes when I see parents and teens interacting in my clinical setting, there's a lot of anger. I, I hear a lot of anger from both parties and specifically, specifically from the parents, <laughs> that they're very angry and very frustrated and it's understandable. And, um, but coming from a place of like, you know, this could actually change. You can do this. I trust you. I believe in you. Those are kinds of things that can really, really help young people see their potential and really make those behavioral changes. So 
A last couple of things that I wanted to share, because we all, most of us here are working with parents, um, is that, you know, talking to parents about rules and expectations, there's different types of parenting. I, I know you guys know about the authoritarian and then authoritative, but sometimes the authoritarian parenting can result in young people breaking rules and acting out. So having, a, you know, clear communication style with the young people, getting to know a teen's friends, you know, figuring out where are they looking online because we know they're getting information from somewhere. So just getting a sense of, you know, where where are you spending your time online and talking a little bit about internet safety. And then I, I mentioned this because I've seen a lot of families struggle so much that they just kind of want to kind of give up. And they are, they kind of end up saying, you know, I just can't, I can't take it anymore. And I just I can't, this is too much, you know, and, and and that is a very fair reaction sometimes when it's been years, in fact, of struggling with a young person with mental health or with addiction. And, um, but I just want to encourage every parent who is here today and everyone who's working with parents or with teens that teens are at such a place of transition and change, their brains are not fully developed and they're growing, they're amazing. They're absolutely amazing and they're very resilient, but they're also, they can change and they have the ability to change. And just telling a teen that I, I am here for you, I, you can contact me any time of the day, any time of the night, I'm here to help. And, um, you know, here's my number, you can call me anytime. I think it goes a long way rather than just saying, I can't take it anymore, you're out. And I, I've seen those relationships in play in, in the clinical setting. And, you know, giving the grace to our young people, giving that patience to our young people is really, really, really important. And um, I'll end here, which is just the treatments for addiction. I think we talked about it really depends on the individual young person's needs. So meeting them where they're at, I have met with young people who are like, I am absolutely not interested in quitting. This is my choice. And that's that that might be a reality, you know, and that might be something that they say. And um, but there are also other methods for treatment that I want to mention, and that includes um, detoxification. That includes behavioral therapies. What's really interesting is that, you know, things like cognitive behavioral therapy have been very useful in um, supporting young people who are struggling with the cravings, addiction, or might feel pressure, even setting boundaries and figuring out boundaries with peers. Behavioral therapy can help with that. Medication, we have gum and patches and, and many other forms of medication when it comes to addiction. Support groups. And then if it's a little bit more serious, things like residential treatment and um, continuing on to outpatient treatment. But one thing I mention sometimes is if I have a young person who is really resistant, and, and I see it all the time, who is really, really resistant is, to any form of support, is I try to think about, okay, well, what are the goals that you have for your day? What are some of the goals you have for your life? And and what about what are the things that you would want to do in addition to Vaping, you know, because it can become a really big part of someone's life. Just some of the young people I meet, it could, it could take up about 10 hours or six hours or five hours. You can figure out how many hours someone is spending either vaping or, you know, you know, vaping or thinking about vaping or craving, you know, those can all take up someone's day a big, big portion of a, a person's day. So asking what would be other things that you would want to do? And that could include what hobbies do you want to be part of? What exercise would you want to do? What kind of food and nutrition do you want to do to be eating for nourishing yourself, you know, outside of vaping? <laughs> what are your goals outside of vaping? Just kind of changing that dialogue and conversation. And how do you want to maintain your stress and your mental health outside of the vape. I know the vape is helping, but what are the other things that we could be doing outside of that? And um, one of the things that um, at Benioff Oakland um, that we had started, one of the clinicians had started had been something called, something related to nature. It's really around nature and it's called Shine and was all the parks in um, the Oakland area or in, just in the community for young people to spend time outside of their homes, walking around and being in nature and and if that's something young people like, really recommending other exercises or activities. And I mentioned this briefly, but um, these are just some various strategies for interventions for vaping cessation, which 
it actually, the, even the, the name of the slide describes how therapy and mental health is related to vaping, because even when it comes to assist, like really stopping vaping, we're using a lot of tools from mental health supports and from our therapists who might help with motivational interviewing or cognitive behavioral be cognitive behavioral therapy or harm reduction therapy, various forms of therapy that might be useful for a young person and their needs. We are very much at the very end. So if you yes. want to just make those <laughs> final comments, we'll try to stay and answer a couple of questions, but I just want to, to thank folks. So let me let Priya finish up. Yes. And so I think this is it for now. I just wanted to share some resources. These are the youth resources on the left side and the adult ally resources on the right. Um, and I would just say that there are luckily text messaging programs and various programs like the Truth Initiative that are really helpful. On the adult ally side, I would say there's a, a really nice Stanford tobacco prevention toolkit that I really like. There are a bunch of parent skits and also the Tobacco Use Prevention Education Program has a resource for adults and um, parents and guardians, which I would strongly recommend with tons of great resources and information on how do we talk to our teens? What do we do? How do we deal with this extremely, extremely challenging uh, issue that young people are facing? Mm -hmm. So I will stop there. I will leave it to questions. And I wanted to thank everyone for your patience and for joining us today. Yeah, and I'll just say thank you so much, Dr. Shankar, for bringing your expertise and enthusiasm here. I want to just remind folks that we will be sending out all of these resources, the slide deck, the recording, so you will have all that. Um, and please, if you're logging off, um, take a moment to give us some feedback on that evaluation that's going to pop up for you. Um, but if you don't mind, a couple of questions before as people are logging off. Um, one of the ones that I, I appreciated from the Q&A is just what, what would you say is one of the best ways to visually explain to young people how the brain works when they vape or smoke? You know, sometimes those visual demonstrations are so helpful with young people. I love, I love that question. You know, to be honest, so firstly, the video I showed you all today is something I've actually shared with young people, and they've really liked that video because it's it's involving a couple young people. And so that video where it was from NBC News, it's a clip that I have shared with two young people and both have said, oh, I didn't even realize that that's happening. So that's one aspect of it. The other aspect is, you know, I'm really, when I'm in the clinic with young people, I'm always bringing out like pictures and charts and I will just show a picture of the brain <laughs> and say, look, like this is how it, you know, they're so strategic and they'll, I'll actually show them, you know, like this is how it impacts different parts of the brain. And, and if you're not uh, like a, in the science field, it's still, there's very, very obvious places and obvious ways, including the neurotransmitters that are impacted because of nicotine and because of vaping. And so those are two of the strategies that I've taken at least, uh, you know, that I've taken with young people. The other thing that I do a lot, and this is not just when it comes to vaping, it's also for things like eating disorders, because I find that that's not just individual. There are so many complex factors that contributed to it, contribute to it, including our messaging and the messages that young people are hearing every day. So I will also talk about like, you know, listen, this is hard. You're in a society that is really telling you something like every single day you're walking around and you're seeing these signs in every single, like all of the different cafes or the different spots that you're at. And so you're seeing these signs that are promoting this. And I just want to tell you that this, I want to show you what some of these signs are actually saying and, and just remind that, remind you that it's not your fault if you felt like kind of pressured because the society is kind of doing that to all of us, especially our young people. And so I, I, I mentioned that because there's a lot of shame and there's a lot of guilt that young people feel as well. And a lot of that is internalized that this is all my fault and I'm the only one experiencing this. And, you know, that, you know, I shouldn't have been, I shouldn't have gotten here. I shouldn't be the one who's here. And so I, I mentioned that and I really feel strongly that to just take away a little bit of that stress that, you know, listen, I understand. And I want to say that it's not your fault. This is a big societal problem. And this is a big challenge. And these are the types of messages that we're seeing. And, but that being said, you know, we can sort of resist that we can sort of, you know, push those aside and, you know, figure out what's right for us. You know, what are our goals? What do we, re what do we really want deep inside outside of the vaping? 
Great, thanks. And I know we're over time, but I'm just going to get one more question in. <laughs> and I apologize to others who asked questions but that we didn't get to. Um, we uh, really appreciate all the, the great questions and inquiry around this topic. Um, but the final question I will ask is, um, someone was raising the question about what recommendation do you have for youth who are just not interested in long, the long-term consequences of vaping? How do you get them motivated? And I think this gets back to the motivational interview, yeah. but if you want to say a little bit more about that. Yes, yes, yes. Um, I, I really want to just stress what you just said, Amy, because, you know, one thing to note about young people is that they will focus more on the short-term consequences of things rather than the long-term consequences of things. So, you know, I think sharing first that this also has short-term impacts, like it can make you feel more anxious. You might not be able to sleep very well. You're not going to be able to have a good appetite, but also just interacting with others. You might not feel like yourself. That's like the short-term aspect. They're not going to be thinking about the lung impacts. <laughs> That's just not going to be on their purview. A lot of times, um, if you might have seen from tobacco um, prevention strategies, they also focus on things like breath like things like your breath might smell bad or your teeth might look a little different, um, that they will change the color of your teeth. So just something else to think about. That's the psychology and the psyche of a young person is very like right now that this is going to impact my behavior right now. And it's going to make me actually feel worse right now. So <laughs> it might make me feel for one second better, but then actually you're going to start to feel worse. So just know that when it comes to vaping and you might have a horrible sleep tonight you know that those are things that are part of their psyche but I think moving beyond that I would really say I really want to stress what Amy said the motivational interviewing and educating ourselves about that because when I have sat down with young people with a chart of the goals what are their life goals what are their future goals and is the vaping in any way impacting that it's amazing to see what they'll share and I found a lot of them sharing, you know, yeah, this does impact my life. This is impacting my life in negative ways. I don't think I'm ready to quit, but I know I'm aware. But that thought will just be sitting there for a little while. And I had mentioned a patient who I'd been working for nine months with. And finally, in the ninth month, I felt like there was a breakthrough where, you know, they mentioned to me, you know what, actually, I think I need to do something about this. And so that patience and planting that seed of the discrepancy, I think that second point of the discrepancy between behaviors and, you know, thought patterns, goals, and, you know, the behaviors that they're entertaining are really, really important to, to mention to them. And um, yeah, so I would say really the motivational interviewing and then asking who, who, who is there for their support? Who do they turn to for help? I think sharing that with young people, you know, who do you turn to for help? Who are your role models? And um, those kinds of questions help them realize like, you know, maybe this is not all I want in my life. Maybe this is not, I don't want this to be 60% of my day. Maybe I want this to be 10% of my day. And slowly, slowly, slowly navigating towards where they want to be is um, part of that patience. So those are some of the strategies I would recommend. And, you know, again, I think, I hope that the biggest learning is please, please be patient with our young people. They need all the support and patience at this time. Thank you so much, thank Dr. Shankar. I'm going to end our webinar now. Thank you all for your engagement and keep an eye out for our follow-up email with the, the resources. So have a great rest of your day.